Throughout history, medical pioneers have always blazed new trails, striving to push humanity forward. In modern medicine, pioneering means advancing that tradition of discovery, finding treatments and cures, and creating solutions to improve patient health and save lives. One institution is leading the way in revolutionary discoveries and precision care. Penn Medicine, part of the renowned University of Pennsylvania, is one of the world's largest and most impactful biomedical research enterprises. With 13 new therapies approved by the US FDA since 2017, we've developed life-changing gene therapies for blindness and spinal muscular atrophy and the world's first approved CAR T-cell therapy, the cancer breakthrough that harnesses the power of our body's own immune system to seek and destroy deadly cancer cells. And with the largest proton therapy center in the world, our pioneers are pushing the boundaries of what's possible in non-invasive cancer treatment. But for Penn Medicine, being a global pioneer is nothing new. Today's breakthroughs are built on a foundation of over 260 years of discovery and innovation. From founding the first hospital and medical school in the US, to trailblazing the first general vaccine for pneumonia, and leading the development of the MRI machine. It's who we are, and it's what we've always done. Uniquely situated between American hubs for finance and influence, Penn Medicine has helped turn Philadelphia, America's founding city, into the epicenter of gene and cell therapy. A powerful convergence of groundbreaking research, exceptional talent, and vital funding, earning the nickname Silicon Valley. Coming together on one urban campus, Penn Medicine and one of the world's leading children's hospitals connect with the Wharton School of Business and the School of Engineering and Applied Science to constantly stimulate new discovery. And with over 40,000 people providing care for millions and supporting academic activities in over 160 countries, Penn Medicine is making a global impact. From discovering new cures to battling pandemics, our expertise in virtually every disease and an unmatched ability to coordinate care across specialties enables us to deliver personalized care like never before. We are Penn Medicine, and we'll never cease in our pursuit of what's next. Always discovering, always innovating, always leading. Hello, everyone, and thank you for joining us. I'm just going to share my screen here. Uh, I'm honored to be part of this webinar um, in terms of orthopedics and how to stay out of trouble. Uh, my name is Samir Mehta, and I'm at the University of Pennsylvania here in Philadelphia, Pennsylvania. Uh, it was an honor to, to watch that um, uh, video uh, and see what our institution has done over the last 260 years. I'm glad to be a part of it for the last 15 that I've been here. Um, so we'll get started. Uh, I'll give a short talk, uh, and then my colleagues in the UK will also uh, uh, give us uh, some input, um, and then we'll have time for some questions. So uh, thank you again for being here today. Um, we're going to talk about orthopedic injuries and how to stay out of trouble. You know, one of the challenges of orthopedic trauma and orthopedic injuries is that there's a huge variety of things that we take care of, things like clavicle fractures or distal humerus fractures or both bone forearm fractures or distal radius fractures or femoral neck fractures. And you can see the list goes on. Uh, and that's really the, the part of the reason I went into orthopedic trauma and orthopedic injuries because of the variety of the injuries that we take care of. Uh, I'm not just a left thumb surgeon. Uh, sometimes I know uh, we all get into our subspecialties a little bit, but um, I do like the variety of what I get to take care of. I'm also reminded of the problem here, right? The problem is that sometimes people tackle cases they shouldn't. Uh, for those of you who might be U.S. football fans, uh, as opposed to U.K. football fans, Rob Gronkowski is a, a tight end for the New England Patriots. He broke his forearm uh, in, in, in a football game, a U.S. football game. He had plate fixation of his forearm performed. Unfortunately, it may 
might not have been done in the ideal manner. And then four weeks later, he rebroke his forearm. Um, and there was some controversy around how he was fixed, who fixed him. I think part of the other issue with orthopedic trauma and orthopedic injury is that this is a little bit of a choose your own adventure. If you remember the choose your own adventure books growing up, I uh, may be dating myself a little bit. Um, there used to be these books where you would read a page and at the end of the page, you would um, pick which, which direction to go. And if you wanted to go down the cave, you'd go to page 62. And if you wanted to climb the ladder, you would go to page 94 and you would follow the book through. And I, sometimes I feel like my work day is a little bit like that. Uh, my favorite one is the one in the middle. Uh, and so um, as I go through this talk, one of the things I'd like to do is leave you with some take home points and I'll use cases to demonstrate that. I think take home point number one is listen to your patients. Uh, this is a young woman, 35 years old, who uh, had been went to her, her GP complaining of hip pain. She was marathon training. Um, and the GP said that she had a uh, hip strain and sent her to physio. Um, she then subsequently went to physio uh, about four to five weeks. The hip pain was only getting worse. Went back to her GP. Um, GP did not get an x-ray. Uh, the GP uh, said that it's still uh, you know, tendonitis. Uh, and so she'd continue therapy uh, and start anti-inflammatories. Um, but did refer her to an orthopedic surgeon uh, who she saw four weeks later. So now it's been almost nine weeks, 10 weeks from the time of her initial onset of pain. Pain with weight bearing, no pain at rest, uh, pain getting worse over time. Um, and then she presented to her outside orthopedic surgeon who did not get an x-ray, but thought she had a labral tear and ordered an MRI, which was going to be performed in two or three weeks, but told her to go ahead and keep walking on it. She then came to our eMERGE with this displaced femoral neck fracture at age 35. That was almost two weeks old from when it became excruciating. So this was almost a 12-week issue, a two-week-old fracture in a 35-year-old female. This is not um, ideal for this patient. Uh, and so that history of young, female, active, marathon training, uh, repetitive sort of loading of the leg, pain with immediate weight bearing, pain at, not at rest, all of these things um, really point to a stress fracture or a pending stress fracture. And unfortunately for her, that was missed. Uh, and the treatment for this becomes quite complicated and complex, so I'll get into. So I think one of the things I, I leave you with is, is, again, listen to your patients. If they have pain after repetitive loading, I would not say it's no big deal. The biology in that area is now altered. It's a big problem and it can happen anywhere in the body, femoral neck, proximal femur, tibia, ankle. It can even happen in ribs. I've taken care of stress fractures in rowers, in ribs, uh, because when they row, the loading on the chest wall results in a, can result in the chest wall getting a stress reaction from the repetitive loading from rowing. This is a young man, he's 18 years old. He'd been complaining of shin pain uh, for several weeks. He's a lacrosse player uh, at a local high school, uh, highly competitive, playing uh, uh, colleges are looking at him like Princeton and Duke, uh, Johns Hopkins. Uh, and he uh, was running on the field, nobody near him. And he snapped his tibia in half. Um, again, this was a stress fracture that was, had been present for some period of time. He'd been complaining to his parents. Uh, they talk, took him to his pediatrician because uh, he was still seeing his pediatrician. His pediatrician told him it was shin splints, nothing to worry about, keep playing through it. He talked to his trainer. His trainer said the same thing, just play through it, uh, ice it after, after your games. And you can see that he went on to a tibia fracture that was treated with an IM nail because it was a mid shaft tibia. Unfortunately, over time, he developed a non-union, which then required further treatment with bone grafting and eventually got him to union nine months later. Uh, but very challenging situation in a young, active, healthy, otherwise healthy male um, that was uh, frankly ignored. Take home point number two from orthopedics is function follows form. If the form is not right, if the axle is bent, then it's hard to function normally. Uh, this is a gentleman who also had a stress fracture of his hip. He's an avid biker. He was biking up in the Vancouver area when he sustained a fracture of his hip. He was fixed uh, outside of the Vancouver area with this hip nail. He's 52 years old, very active, bikes two to 300 miles a week easily, sometimes more, active skier. And he came to see me in Philadelphia about six months after his injury, um, complaining of hip pain. He had seen some other 
physicians. He'd seen his uh, GP, he'd seen a physiatrist, uh, he'd seen physio, uh, and they all said the same thing. Uh, the hip is fine, you're fine, uh, you should uh, do some more therapy, uh, maybe consider a hip replacement. But if you look very carefully at his full length scanning x-ray, you'll see that the right leg is shorter than the left. And you'll also see that the hip neck angle, the femoral neck shaft angle, is quite flat compared to the other side. It, this, this side where my arrow is, is quite flat. Is your pointer. The, this angle here of the head neck shaft is quite flat compared to the other side. And when you when we map this out, his right hip is at 110 degrees and his left hip is 130 degrees, along with his limb length inequality. So ultimately we decided to do an osteotomy to save his hip. I won't go through the nuances of that, but the idea is to break the hip and then restore the normal anatomy. And what that results in is improvement from a functional perspective. And that's him two years later skiing, actually back again in Vancouver, in Whistler. Take home point number three is that trauma is not a recreational sport. I think we'll hear a little bit later from Paul about this concept that uh, you know, trauma is not something that everybody does. Historically, at least in the US, uh, many general orthopedic surgeons would take orthopedic trauma call and they would take a shot at fixing things. I can tell you this is an example of that. This is a gentleman who was playing ice hockey. He broke his femur. Um, he was taken to a local community hospital. They put this rod down his femur. He was discharged from the orthopedic surgeon at three months saying he was fine. Um, he went to his GP complaining of thigh pain. The GP got x-rays um, and noticed that on the report that the fracture had not healed. And at nine months, he still had not healed. And you can see that he's got a non-union of his femur. The other interesting thing about this particular image is that this rod is put in the wrong place. This is a straight rod that's supposed to start where my laser pointer is. There's a different type of rod that goes through this entry hole up here in the trochanter called a trochanteric nail. In his case, the straight nail, the piriformis nail was put through a trochanteric starting point. And that's a little bit of a problem because that will lead to uh, this kind of uh, deformity. So his surgery went from being relatively straightforward to more complex. We had to open his thigh up. We had to remove the rod that was present. We had to put a plate and screws on. And then ultimately we got him to heal and he was back to playing hockey six months after his non-union surgery. Take home point number four is that post-injury intervention matters. You know, there's this uh, saying in the US sometimes, treat them and street them meaning uh, you fix the patient or you fix their issue and then you put them back out there uh, and, and there's no further follow-up. And that's not the philosophy that should be used for this particular population. Um, this is a woman, she's a triathlete, a professional triathlete. She actually is the CEO of a pharmaceutical company, but that's really a hobby. Her day job is being a triathlete. Um, and so she sustained a clavicle fracture, but also this very complex glenoid fracture. And they fixed the clavicle, but then said the glenoid is too complex, nothing to do. However, because of her profession of being a, essentially a triathlete, um, she required fixation, at least to be able to swim. Uh, so you can see the exposure that we did to get down to her glenoid. Um, and then the reconstruction with small plates and screws. And then ultimately she went to, back to being a triathlete about a year and a half after her surgery with us. So getting back to the training regimen uh, and getting back to, uh, strength in that arm, but she's back to being a triathlete again. And you can see the post-op CT showing the reduction of the joint. I think take home number point number five is really important, which is you need to seek out disease. This is an interesting case that actually just presented to my clinic recently. This is a 70 something year old woman. Uh, she's had prior spine surgery. Uh, she's complaining of left hip pain. Uh, she has pain in the middle of her thigh with weight bearing. Um, she has no pain at rest. Uh, she has no groin pain. She has no buttock pain. She has no numbness and no tingle. She was originally seen by her GP and because of her history of her spine surgeries, she was sent to a spine surgeon where um, they performed an MRI of her spine and they also got an EMG of her spine. No x-ray. She then went, that was all negative or there was no pathology there. So she was seen and sent to a joint specialist for a possible hip replacement because the idea was she has hip arthritis. My colleague uh, obtained an x-ray of her pelvis 
and was smart enough to recognize the lesion on her femur right where my laser pointer is. And a very important part of the history that I didn't share is that she has been on a bisphosphonate, Fosamax, for over a decade. And so what she has brewing in her left hip is an impending pathologic fracture of the subtrochanteric femur, secondary to ex long-term exposure to bisphosphonates, also known as an atypical femur fracture. You can see on the right side where she's not painful, she also has some signs of bone cortical thickening. And if you look very carefully, you can start to see the beginnings of the fracture. And so this woman went through multiple physicians. She went through some unnecessary testing, again, because someone wasn't seeking out disease. And her treatment was fairly straightforward, a prophylactic intermedullary nail to protect the femur prior to it breaking. Um, and then the other side was not symptomatic, although we had a long talk with her about prophylactically nailing the other side, and we'll wait till she becomes symptomatic on that side, if she becomes symptomatic on that side. She's been taken off of her Fosamax uh, at this point. Trauma and fracture care is a team event. Uh, I, I, I tell people this all the time. Part of the reason I chose to go into trauma is because of the fact that you get to interact with many different specialties, many different physicians, many different providers. And I think this is an important uh, uh, part of why I chose to be part of this community. This is a 25-year-old female. She was a, she's a professional motorcycle racer, rider. Uh, 10 days prior to her presenting, she had an uh, injury to her knee. Um, she had some decreased sensation around the perineal nerve. We got our neurologists involved as well in her care. Um, and she had this fracture that seems somewhat trivial when you look at it initially, the small fracture in the back of her knee. Um, you get the CT scan, you can see the large articular piece that's missing. Um, and then you look at this even in more detail and you can see why she's got some restriction in motion. You can see this fragment is incarcerated in the joint and she has some instability to her knee. And so we had a long talk with her about treatment options. We got our sports medicine colleagues involved. And ultimately, we did a prone exposure to her knee, found those fragments of bone, reduced them with some small plates and screws, and then ultimately got her, her motion back. She had a tremendous amount of physio as part of her treatment regimen. Um, and that's her post-operative x-rays. And that's her about nine months later racing. Um, I don't remember if it's the down knee or not, but um, uh, I will tell you that either way, I'm not happy with this picture. <laughs> I think I could, I could stomach that picture. Um, she is looking for racing sponsorships. You keep asking if we'll sponsor her for Penn Medicine, but um, if you're looking for a sponsor or racer, she's looking for sponsorship. Take home point number seven, don't succumb to therapeutic nihilism. Uh, what I mean by that is uh, I hear a lot from patients and from providers, oh, it's a really bad injury. It's going to be a really bad outcome. And I think one of the things that you'll hear from the panel today that it, is that it doesn't have to be a bad injury and a bad outcome. It can be a bad injury. It doesn't have to be a bad outcome. Um, and that just because the, uh, there's a significant injury to the articular surface or to the joint, that there is possibility to get a good outcome. And so this is a woman, she's actually a semi-professional speed skater. Uh, near Philadelphia is a big speed skating sort of area that people come train at. This injury, I, I wouldn't consider this uh, all that bad. She saw a local practitioner who um, actually said that she would never be able to skate again uh, and that her career was over. Um, it's, it's, I think, a fairly straightforward pattern on CAT scan, which they didn't obtain, right? So they, we didn't get that advanced imaging to, again, to seek out disease and understand what we're dealing with. We fixed her uh, with standard sort of plates and screw technique. And then this is uh, her post-operatively. And then this is her about nine months later uh, doing the, I think the Hawaii marathon is where she sent me this picture from. Um, she still speed skates, but she's doing other athletics and other sports uh, as well. And the last take home point that I have is that you are their advocate. Um, as, as, their, as their provider, whether you're their GP or their orthopedic surgeon or their physio or uh, any interaction you're having as their healthcare uh, uh, personnel, you are, their, um, you are their advocate in terms of uh, treatment uh, and uh, care. So I encourage you uh, to listen to your patients and really hopefully uh, he help them get in the right direction. Uh, I wanna thank you for your time. I think we'll have time later for questions and I am going to pass this off to my colleagues. Thank you, Samir. I think that's a fantastic array of cases. Uh, 
that shows the variety that you mentioned in 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 your practice and and very educational um so i'm gonna follow with some food and alcohol trauma um my name is sesk Majalad. i'm a consultant um trauma and orthopedic surgeon uh, uh, specializing in food and ankle. So in your, in, in Samir's uh, Choose Your Storybooks, uh, probably my, my story always ends in front of a foot or an ankle. It's not that varied like, like your practice, uh, but I do cover all aspects of, of foot and ankle, including elective work and, and trauma. And Today, um, in order to stay out of trouble in foot and ankle trauma, my, my plan was to show you a few examples of how some misdiagnosis or, or, or mal diagnosis, the wrong diagnosis or a delayed diagnosis can lead to a much more complex uh, treatment and, and most of the times to, to poorer outcomes and the importance of that um, initial well-done diagnosis. Um, as an overview, we're going to be looking at a calcaneal fracture, a tailless fracture, and it's not a fracture, but an Achilles tendon rupture, which is also an acute, and, um, uh, an acute injury that requires emergent treatment and, and Q's and A's at the end. So um, starting with Carl Kainu, um, this is a patient who's a 62-year-old construction worker, fell from height in 2016. He attended the local hospital where he was diagnosed with um, Carl Kainu fracture, and they opted for non-operative management. He then attends um, my clinic in, a year later, complaining of constant pain over the lateral aspect of the foot, even causing difficulty to wear most type of shoes, and he has not been back to work since. Um, on examination, you can clearly see a plane of valgus deformity of the foot, and he was exquisitely tender laterally uh, with signs of subfibular impingement. His ankle joint as well had reduced range of motion. And these are the x-rays at um, the initial presentation. Over here on the left-hand side, you can see how there is a, a, a block of bone, which basically is the calcaneum, which is in contact with the fibula. And on the lateral view, the calcaneal appears much, much flatter than it, it should be. Uh, on, on the top, there's a normal view of the calcaneum. You see that it has an, an inclination um, from the floor. And when you look at all at the, the position of the tailors, there's also a, a, a specific angle, a, a declination angle that um, has been flattened in his case because the whole um, calcaneum was basically flattened like a pancake. And these are the um, CT scans of the injury. Over here, you can see how this piece of bone, which belongs there, has healed in a, in, in, in a very um, uh, displaced position. Uh, the articular surface of the subtalar joint is smashed. There is um, bone loss. And more interestingly, the calcaneal is articulating with the fibula, which that should never happen. Right? You see how on, on, on that coronal view, that piece of calcaneal has basically been spat out and is um, in contact with the fibula, which in turn creates that impingement. Those um, perineal tendons that normally should sit around there have been all the way there uh, um, just rubbing on the tip of that fibula and that causes extreme pain. In that case, we, we had to perform a, a surgical reconstruction with um, a few gestures. Initially, subtalar distraction bone block arthrodesis because with that bone block, you 
are able to increase that height and correct the biomechanics and also deal and address that degenerative changes on the subtalar joint um, with a fusion or an arthrodesis. The lateral wall that was spat out would have to be removed so that you can um, clear out that area where the perineal tendons sit and there's no more subfibular impingement. And we also explore those perineal tendons because they're likely to be damaged and possibly have some tears. These are interoperative images of the procedure. As you can see there, those, those wires are meant to um, uh, retract the, the, the flap of skin that we've, um, that we've opened up. We've, we went through an um, extended lateral approach, which is a significant um, approach um, to the foot and uses a, a flap of skin that basically um, opens up and shows the, the whole of the calcaneum and also the lateral, um, the lateral wall and the subtalar joint. That piece of bone there is meant to increase the height of the calcaneum and then it was fixed with two screws. Note how we've cleared the area where before there was a piece of bone, a chunk that was in contact with the bone, with the fibula, and also in contact with, with the perineal tendons. And these are the x-rays one year down the line with a uh, nicely fused um, subtalar joint. The patient has a better range of movement, better dorsiflexion, and we manage to increase the height of the calcane uh, of, of the um, of the foot um, and the inclination of the um, talus uh, by a few by a few millimeters. Now there are some. This is the 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 extended lateral approach that we did, and there are some risks with that approach, mainly those to um, the skin and the soft tissues. The soft tissues uh, suffer not only the initial impact of the injury, but also the surgical impact. And, and this is um, substantial, right? You end up um, going through angiosomes and creating an area here at the corner that has poor blood supply. And that places the the, the um, patient at risk of skin breakdown and wound infections like in that image. To try and avoid that, we came up with this um, paper that just was published at the foot this month uh, and, and accessing the, the subtalar joint for uh, distraction bone block arthrodesis through a medial approach instead so that there are no um, areas of tension. That can be done in cases where you don't have to look at the perineal tendons or there's not such a, a lateral uh, wall blowout like the previous case. And we did it with this patient who had a previous um, uh, non-treated tailor fracture as well. As you can see, there's a fragment that is still floating around. He managed for some time but um, he, he was complaining of significant pain and restricted uh, range of motion when he came to us. And we did a similar um, operation, bone block arthrodesis using actually this piece of bone at the back as a distraction um, bone graft. And these are some of the intraoperative images. The only difference is that we went through the medial side so that this is a much more forgiving area. You don't run into risks of, um, uh, of, of skin necrosis as much as in the lateral area. And very importantly, you see how we tend to uh, distract and correct the biomechanics that were, um, that were wrong initially. That biomechanical correction is, is important to give them good um, range of motion. And now moving on to Taylor's. Um, this is another patient, a 30 year old male who fell from a climbing wall, um, uh, in, so unable to bear weight on, on a right ankle, attended A&E, and they diagnosed a grade one sprain of the ATFL. They did mention it was a bit swollen. So there, maybe there was something 
that um, they were considering, although it didn't redeem them from, um, from getting the wrong diagnosis. These are the initial radiographs. We're looking at, because he was complaining of ankle pain, everyone's looking at the fibula and the tibia, no fractures there, must be, an, must be an ankle sprain, right? But then on the 4th of July, a few days later, he was recalled. Uh, they said there's a missed talus fraction. When you look at the talus, you're thinking of the image I, I, I just showed um, on, on the initial um, slide, and you're thinking of a neck of the talus fracture. But there are cases like this one where the fracture is not just at the neck. There are different types of um, fractures of the talus, and they basically compare to the anatomical um, areas. So each one of these can be fractured. And what we're talking about here is the lateral process of the fracture. It's that area here that articulates with both the fibula and the calcaneum and has that extensive um, cartilaginous um, surface that is very important um, pathologically because whenever there's a slight um, disturbance or a slight mal reduction, those fractures very quickly go into, into um, arthritis. You can see how these is articular surface and so is that area here. So um, that fracture has both um, um, joints, both the subtalar and the ankle joint affected. And even though it's a very small piece of bone and very, um, if, if you're not looking for that, you might not see the fracture, it's important to diagnose it. And that is what we call the snowboarder's fracture, uh, basically because of the mechanism of injury. It happens in forced dorsiflexion and inversion. And that's something that the snowboarders, when they fall from a big jump and the whole body weight goes over the board with the foot strapped on, on the board, um, the, the, that force moves the ankle into a forced dorsiflexion and inversion. It is, it is misdiagnosed, as, as we've seen, as an ankle sprain, but thinking of the mechanism of injury, the ankle sprain is normally an inversion injury, which is the opposite movement. And I'll give you a few clues so that um, hopefully you will never miss one of those. They are mainly based on examination and radiology. Going back to our case, these are the city images because radiology um, might not be as, as um, obvious on the X-ray, but it's very, very obvious on the CT. And if you think about one of these fractures, the CT scan is always um, the investigation of choice. You can see how there's um, incongruity of the joint um, with, a, with an articular fragment that it's depressed, and this needs to be reduced to avoid any um, consequences on the joint. These are intra-articular images um, of the fixation with um, K wires. Uh, the fracture was um, anatomically reduced and then plated some intra-articular um, intra-operative pictures, and that's the patient six months post-operatively with no signs of um, degeneration in the joint, no arthritis in the patient doing well. So in order to never miss one of these injuries, um, a few clues. One would be uh, during the examination, we want to replicate the mechanism of injury, which is in external rotation. And with, uh, with one finger pointing at that lateral process of the talus, is basically underneath the tip of the, of the fibula, you, you can move the foot into external rotation and eversion and squeeze that little fragment. Patient would jump off the bed if they have this, this uh, fracture. And also the x-ray, you have to look for uh, subtle um, signs, but they're very, very um, helpful. A normal mortise view, and it has to be a mortise view because the mortise 
view will show you the whole join line perfectly um, spot on from the front. You, if, if it's an AP, you won't see that area on the side and, you, and you're likely going to miss uh, some of these injuries. So Mortis is the perfect view for any injury in the ankle, in, in my, in my um, opinion, uh, because it gives you a lot of information. And you can see a clear line all throughout the joint from medial to lateral. Over here, there's also a clear line, but you can see a little um, fracture line in that lateral process. That's where we're looking at. Or if you have a little bit of crumbling and different um, bone pieces in that area, you must suspect one of these injuries. On the lateral view, um, there has been this uh, V-sign uh, um, term, and that is looking at the, the lateral process from the side. It has a, a V-shape of about 90 degree angle. When, it, when this angle becomes more acute, or when there is a disruption of this angle, then you again should suspect one of those fractures. But really, to never miss one, when you have a suspicion, CT scan is the way to go. Um, and that not only helps you for the diagnosis, but also helps you plan for the surgery, because most of these fractures will require surgery unless they're grossly undisplaced in a non-active um, patient. Um, they would require surgery to avoid any um, sequelae and osteoarthritis mainly. And to finish off with the Achilles, um, Achilles ruptures, everyone has seen one of those in their practice, I'm, I'm, I'm sure, but they're very easily um, misdiagnosed. Um, if you're not thinking about them, you can easily let them slip. Um, there's a 52-year-old um, um, gentleman who was playing football with his son. When his foot was planted on the ground, he felt a sudden um, sharp pain at the back of the ankle as if someone kicked me. And he looked back at the back behind him and there was not such someone, but um, he couldn't carry on with the game. Three days later, the pain was much improved. He was able to walk fine. He was able to plan to flex the ankle actively and he thought it was all good. But then a guardian angel would, or a radiologist friend in, in this occasion, suggested that he had an MRI scan. And then he did. But when you see this presentation on top of your differentials, there should be an Achilles rupture, very clear presentation of, um, of, of an Achilles rupture. Yes, it could be something else, gastrocnemius, calf muscle tear, Achilles tendinopathy, or even uh, some, some ostrigonum. But these are not um, urgent um, uh, injuries. They don't require emergent treatment, whereas an Achilles rupture does, and that's why it's important that we don't miss one of them. During the examination, these become very apparent, very clear when, when you see an Achilles rupture, and basically it's a clinical diagnosis. If you know how to examine them, you won't miss one of these. Um, loss of contour of the Achilles, the left foot, when you don't see that nice and, and thick tendon clearly, that's because something happened there and that's how they present. On the right hand side is an intact Achilles and that's how they should look. You lose the contour when, when they're ruptured because of swelling and inflammation. Now the Simmons test, um, which I have to say in that's a UK term. In, in the US, our colleagues call it Thompson test. It's the same thing. Uh, I don't know who invented or who named it first, and I'm not going to get into this debate, but um, this is the same type of test where you squeeze the calf uh, when the patient is in a prone position, and on the rupture side, you see there's no movement whatsoever. A normal ankle would uh, plantar flex as you squeeze the calf and and that is the most important uh, test to diagnose an Achilles rupture. 
There's another test called the Mattel's test or the angle of dangle, resting angle of the ankle also. In this patient, the injured leg is the right leg and you see how it is it's resting flat um, uh, when, when both legs are um, bent and pointing up on the, on the, on the ceiling. It, you can also see that when the patient is prone, but it's probably less evident than on, on the, um, um, a knee bend. And that tells you that that tendon doesn't have the right tension. It's elongated or ruptured. And, and that tendon won't have enough power to then have a normal gait or give you an, a normal push-off. And you might think, well, that patient was able to plant to flex the ankle. Surely there must be maybe a partial tear. And that's the, the main confusing factor, right? The, the par partial tears, first of all, are, are quite rare. But um, the fact that you can plant to flex doesn't rule out an, an Achilles rupture. Uh, why does that happen? Because plantar flexion can be done by other muscles, right? All the posterior muscle groups uh, can, can plantar flex. Um, you can do that by activating the, the FDL, FHL, the flexors of the toes, right? And um, those will, will plantar flex the ankle, although it won't have enough strength to give you normal weight. And this is one of those um, videos that shows you the mechanism of injury. And it's very, it's very much um, as it, a textbook. That's, he looks back, he plants his foot, and then he says, whoa, something happened at the back of my ankle. There was nobody there. No, nobody kicked him. But even David Beckham there knew that he, he ruptured his Achilles because that is a very plant, planting the foot, overstretched, rapid eccentric loading, and he looks at the back, very classic. The initial treatment of these injuries uh, has to be in a quietness. Right? You can either use a, a back slap or a boot, but in both cases, you have to use uh, an, uh, either wedges or place the, the ankle in an equinus position so that the tendon ends are approximated. The treatment uh, nowadays, it's, it's um, ultrasound dependent, and that will look at the position of the tendon ends in full plantar flexion. Um, if that tendon gap is less than 10 millimeters, there's enough evidence to suggest that patients will heal well with non-operative management, even those that are very active uh, or even elite um, sportsmen. And otherwise, um, a surgery would be indicated. And if we're doing that, ideally, we want to do it with um, a minimally invasive approach so that uh, the risk of uh, wound issues is diminished. If you don't treat the Achilles initially, which is it's a very easy, straightforward treatment, the patient will come back to you and the way they present when there's been a neglected or, uh, or a misdiagnosed Achilles is that they are, are, are limping. They feel that they can't have enough strength to have a normal gait. And they always complain or most often about um, their heel. The heel is painful because that heel is, is um, contacting the floor without the, the right um, Achilles uh, or the plant flexing ability to, to um, push off. That would require reconstruction that um, um, differently from the initial treatment of an acute Achilles rupture, it involves increased morbidity and the outcomes will never be as good as the primary repair. Um, we have um, published also a, a paper on the management of those Achilles, um, chronic Achilles tendon ruptures, <clears throat> excuse me, and um, that involves um, tendon harvesting most of the time so that we can uh, augment the, the reconstruction and reducing the, the tendon, uh, which is in an elongated position, into the right um, tension. 
And that's all for me. Thank you very much. Uh, hi, guys. Um, Cesc, thank you so much. Great, great to see you. And thanks for, for as usual, a, a great talk. Um, and Samir, um, absolutely fascinating. Great to see your cases. And thank you. Thank you both so much. Um, I am going to take this from a slightly different angle, if I may. Um, so the topic is how to stay out of trouble in orthopedic trauma. And we've heard a lot about getting the correct early diagnosis and, and implementing that correct early care. And of course, it's imperative. It's probably the most important factor in determining the patient's outcome. Um, but I'm going to just take a little bit of a step back and talk about some other aspects of that. Um, I'm going to try to keep it quite concise, so I'm hoping we've got an opportunity to have, um, have a, bit of a, a bit of a chat afterwards um, and ask some questions. Um, so, um, my name is Paul Culpin. I'm an orthopaedic consultant, um, uh, and I, um, I guess what's actually more important is to state that I'm an orthopaedic and trauma surgeon. Um, and I think nowadays it's worth emphasizing that because the reality is that, that, that the way we practice, particularly in the UK, has changed, and it's changed really quite significantly uh, over the past 10 years or so. And, and the reason it's changed is to do with the fact that we created, um, we, we created major trauma centers. Um, my practice is largely in, is, is in hips and knees. Um, and I split my time between working at the Royal London Hospital, which is uh, one of the big teaching hospitals in London and is most famous for being a major trauma center. Um, and there my practice is on uh, lower limb trauma, particularly around the pelvis, hip and knee. Um, and and it's also, uh, I also have an elective practice uh, on quite often the more complex aspects of hip and knee surgery and salvage surgery, hip and knee replacements and revision surgery. Privately, I do exactly the same. Um, and, uh, and my practice is divided maybe not proportionally quite the same, but it's exactly the same scope of practice. And it's worth emphasizing, I think, because um, things have definitely changed. And mostly it's been a very, very positive change. 10 or 11 years ago, it was in 2010, in the UK, we decided that we were going to create a network of trauma, so trauma hospitals. Um, and what it meant was that if you had um, a major injury, if you were multiply injured, or if the, if the isolated injury was of a certain complexity, you wouldn't go to your local hospital, but you would be, you'd, you'd be taken, you'd be diverted directly to a major trauma centre. So this was piloted in London, um, and we split London into four, four quadrants, um, and, uh, and we defined which of the regional hospital is going, is going to feed into the major trauma center. Um, and this is, this is a, a map of London and the hospital that Sesk and I work in is the Royal London Hospital and we cover the Northeast Quadrant. Now this shows London, but actually this goes all the way out to Essex and the coast. So, uh, so actually geographically is much bigger than that and covers you know, uh, several million people. Um, so it's got a huge catchment area. And what used to happen is if you'd injured yourself, then somebody would call an ambulance and you'd be taken to your local hospital. And the thought was that you're best to get to hospital as quickly as possible so that, so that care can be initiated. Now, the, the problem with that was that we had a plethora, tons of centers doing a huge variety of cases and nobody getting lots of experience in the more complex end of the spectrum. Hence the thought in major trauma centres. So this is the Royal London Hospital. Um, we've got the helipad in the top. And we, it's, it's famous, as said, for trauma. And it was where the uh, helicopter emergency service was, was launched in the London area. So for a long time, it was the only teaching hospital, the only hospital that had an emergency helipad. So it's always been known for trauma. Um, but it's never been defined with regards to what the network is. Um, so... The idea being that instead of you, and for an example here, we've, we've picked the Whittington. 
instead of you uh, going directly to, um, to your local hospital, the ambulance would actually divert and take you straight to the Royal London Hospital. However, if you ended up at your local hospital, you shouldn't get past, past accident, accident in the emergency. So you shouldn't get past the ER department. So if you've arrived and you've got an open fracture um, or you've injured uh, two or more parts of your body, uh, then actually they should, they should basically get you, push you back in the ambulance and send you back down to the Royal London Hospital. Um, and so there's not the problem of subsequently transferring patients if the need arises. Um, and that's, that's in theory very good, and it is very good in a number of ways. Now the ideal is, or was, um, that you have your acute care at the major trauma centre, and then you go back for your rehabilitation, for your aftercare, you go back to your more local hospital, which is just the trauma centre. Um, and that's where rehabilitation is meant to happen. Now this is where it all kind of unraveled and becomes not quite as good because we're not really very good at rehabilitation, especially in the London area. And we're not very good at getting patients um, back to their, to their regional hospital. So it's not without its problems, but it still represents um, actually a massive step forward when we're talking about the care that the patients are, are treating. Um, I'm trained predominantly in London throughout you know, most of my, most of my uh, trainee years. And so I, I was actually working at Royal London at, at all stages as a junior doctor, as a, as a registrar, as a kind of intermediate level doctor. Um, but it wasn't until I came back as a consultant 11 years ago that we began to do pelvic trauma. So before that, pelvic trauma, despite Royal London still being the big major trauma centre, we didn't do pelvic trauma and those patients had to wait and be transferred to another facility. Now we do everything in trauma and it's a much, much better level of care than we used to be able to deliver. It's resulted in centralization of, of trauma care. So you get real expertise, real motivation and enthusiasm from the team that delivers that. And it's delivered truly in an MDT setting. Um, uh, and it's great for patient care. It's also great for training, uh, training of surgeons, uh, nurses, physios, it's, it's a fantastic um, uh, opportunity for them to gain really vast experience. And at the Royal London, we've become the major trauma centre in London, in the UK, and the busiest in, in Europe for, for when it comes to managing more complex cases. It used to be a really difficult problem when a patient is, is admitted to a hospital peripherally and then subsequently has to get, has to get transferred in. Um, and so this has tried to bypass that as an issue. Unfortunately, if a patient does get admitted to the trauma center, then we still have issues with beds. Um, the UK system, as you're mostly all, all aware, we run at capacity beyond, beyond basically 100% always. And so there's very little slack in the system. Um, but the acute care is great. It saves lives and it saves limbs and um, and it's actually, and our pre-hospital care is actually world leading. You know, the, the, what our pre-hospital doctors can do um, in keeping people alive and scraping off the pavement and the roads is phenomenal. Um, uh, and so we literally have people that in, in previous days had unsurvivable injuries arriving at our trauma centers for us to, uh, to, to um, put them back together again. What's the downsides to this? So there are downsides, um, not really in the concept of, the, of what happens in the major trauma center per se, but the secondary effect of that is that a decade ago, all orthopedic surgeons were orthopedic and trauma surgeons. Now, for 10 years, the local centers have not been managing complex trauma. Um, and what that obviously leads to is some de-skilling some loss of interest in it. Um, and so, so, so I, I don't, there is an important distinction to be made that, that your orthopedic surgeons are not all the same. We're much more subspecialized, but, um, but there's a lot of uh, elective surgeons who really treat no trauma. And as you've seen from the previous two talks, even making the right diagnosis is actually 
quite challenging um, in some cases, and you have to have that specialist interest to, to, to ensure that mistakes do not happen. We have issues with bed blocking. We can't move patients back and forward very easily. And the aftercare is lamentable, especially in London. Okay, so this is this is where we're really, really, uh, uh, you know, it's really, uh, really disappointing the care that patients get. Um, so I've got just a few examples. So I'm not going to uh, take too much more time, but push through a few examples just to highlight a couple of more points. Um, so this is a case from a few years ago now, and this is an example of major trauma center working brilliantly. So he, 22 year old guy, he is full of uh, testosterone, driving his car at high speed, like a bit of a maniac, and he crashes his car. Now, we don't see many of these in London because there's so much traffic, we can't get up much speed and we all wear a seatbelt. But this guy managed to cause quite significant trauma, and it was an isolated injury to his, to his pelvis. Um, what you can see is pretty unusual injury. He's got bilateral hip dislocations is the most obvious feature. Each individual injury, the left and the right side, is potentially life-changing. They're very severe injuries. On the right side, we can see the, 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 the hip is dislocated, and we can see this fragment of bone is the posterior wall of his acetabulum. It's the back of the socket. Um, now, that injury is actually... In acetabular fractures doesn't carry the best prognosis. Uh, about a third of those patients end up requiring, or even more, 40% can end up requiring hip replacements within, the, within a year or two. And that's because it quite often rips off the blood supply and causes a lot of soft tissue damage. So it in itself is a very bad injury. But over and above that, he's got an equally bad injury on his left side. He's dislocated his hip in a rather unusual position. And this fragment of bone isn't from acetabulum, it's from his femoral head. So he's, he's uh, sheared off part of his femoral head. So each injury is very significant. We can see we don't rely on x-rays so much nowadays and CT scans in trauma is pretty much paramount to a lot of the more complex injury assessment. Um, and so we've got very rapid access to it. That's how we manage a lot of certainly the more complex cases. So uh, the one side of our posterior wall fracture and, and so the emergent treatment is when you come into accident emergency is we reduce the hips, we pull them and put them back in joint. And that takes the heat out of the situation at least for a few hours so that we can come to surgery um, typically the next day. So we're not taking this patient to theater um, uh, unless there's any um, uh, hemodynamic issues or, or limb threatening issues. So. Uh, he was basically cardiovascularly stable and taking, reducing his hips reduced the emergent nature of this. Um, and so he's got quite complex injuries, each side requiring big reconstructive surgery. Um, and we work as a team, and that's one of the wonderful things about working in a hospital right, like the Royal London. It's a team sport, I think, as uh, Samir was pointing out, it's one of the great appeals to trauma surgery. Um, and, uh, and I did... I think we did the, the left side first. So I did the left side. Now, I've created a fracture here. I've created a fracture in his greater trochanter. And in fact, we did it in both sides. Um, and that was part of the surgical approach to try to get an exposure that was going to protect the soft tissues. Around the outside here is where your, um, your hip abductors are. And they can very commonly get contused and injured and damaged when, you, when they have such injuries. And we're very keen that we do not want to further damage that in our surgical approach. Um, and so this is a very elegant way for me to elevate the hip abductors, preserve the blood supply if it's still intact, and allow me to dislocate and expose the femoral head, put the bone fragment back and reduce the hip. And we use the same approach for this, uh, the right side, and that's because the posterior wall is quite a large fragment. And so again, it was, it was an, ele it's an elegant way to, to, to mobilize those abductors. Um, now, this patient, bilateral injury, so he can't mobilize straight away and wait to bear. Um, so he spends um, a couple of months basically going bed to chair before we're able to do very much with him. But he's young, fit and healthy, and this is him at a year. And what I'm pleased to say at the year is that his hips are congruent. So he's not developed arthritis 
markedly anyway in either hip. You could argue maybe there's a bit of blurring here, and I think that's that that's that's something that we we'd had to we'd have to continue watching. Um, but what's nice is we've not got any extra bone formation around the soft tissues, um, and I've got a clinical video of them. Uh, so he dressed especially for the video. Um, and this is him at the year mark. So this is him uh, in my clinic. And I follow these patients up typically for a couple of years after such, such severe injuries. And he's got fantastic muscle definition and control. Um, great range of motion across uh, uh, across the hip joint. And then another leg. And I asked him to stand and he's choosing to hop. So that's a pretty good indication. And he flinches there because he's got a medial meniscal tear. Um, so a fantastic outcome, a great demonstration of how the system can work brilliantly and usually and often does. I'm going to touch just in a few cases rather briefly because I would like to still to have a few moments for questions. This is a lady who uh, was not from London. She's 59 years old, fit and healthy. In fact, she's a horse rider, very enthusiastic horse rider. Um, and she lives up near Newcastle in the north of the country. Um, and she went to her local hospital. She fell from her horse. And it, there was a question of whether she may have uh, sustained a pelvic fracture. She was, uh, she had um, an assessment that if she, if she had the pelvic fracture, it was a stable fracture, which is not unreasonable. And, um, and she was managed conservatively. She made her way to London eventually. Um, and these are the first views that I have available for me. Um, now, this is her standing on her right leg. Uh, and you can see uh, when, sorry, this is her standing on her left leg, the, the right leg is raised, and when she stands on her right leg, you can see the whole, can you see this asymmetry? Um, the, the, the left side of the pelvis goes up, and then when she stands on her other leg, it's rever it reverts to the other way around. Um, so this is an example of a lady who, this is what happens when she walks. Her pelvis is moving, she's got pelvic instability, and it took me being, I think, the fifth doctor to see her, including private hip surgeons in London, who told her there was no problem with her hips and no problem with her pelvis. And that's because an isolated supine AP view of her pelvis does not reveal an abnormality. It's only when you take a history, you examine the patient, and you arrange for the correct investigations is this revealed. And this needs stabilization, front and back stabilization, and that's what I've done. Um, and this is her subsequently standing on each leg and you can see the pelvis doesn't move and it was a very long journey for this lady but we got her back to full full activity and a great result um, and it's just an example of a patient who uh, didn't have adequate follow-up and didn't have a, spe a specialist with interest in this type of injury or trauma experience following up her care two other brief examples so this scenario, and this is a common scenario, is a patient has had quite a bad distal femoral fracture, a fracture around the femur, but who fails to progress in a rehabilitation. She's young, fit and healthy. She had a ski injury. She had this fracture with the distal femur, which was fixed, not badly, not at our center, but somewhere else. You can argue that the plate is lying a little bit anterior in the lateral side. The reduction is not perfect, but none of it is so bad. The problem was, that she failed to progress. She, she was reporting um, uh, real discomfort and inability to, to gain knee flexion. Um, and the most common reason for this in patients that have had uh, distal femoral fractures is prominence of the screws. And especially in the skinnier patient, it is often very, very easy to see if you look for it. It's very easy for, uh, for these screws to be uh, be placed a little bit long and they impale the VMOs, the medial, medial vastus. In this case, this actually wasn't the case, but this is a, that's the most common scenario. Here we can see that she's still, and she's not united, so I can't, this cannot be removed. Actually, the cause of her, of her, um, of her issue is to do with this bone fragment. So she had prominent bone spicules who, which were impaling the VMOs and limiting her knee flexion. So it's too early to remove the implant, but what we did was go in and remove the, the, the prominent bone spikes. And when we did that, her recovery ended up being really excellent. So just be aware of the patients that fail to progress in their, in their rehabilitation. Okay, 
next and actually final example because I want to I want to wind this up. Um, uh, so a patient who had quite a, I don't have the pre-op image, so just a post-op, um, and this is his first post-op image. He had he also had a hip dislocation and he had a posterior wall fracture, which we we managed in a standard fashion um, uh, and restored his anatomy quite nicely. He was allowed to get up, mobilize, non-weight bearing on this side for the first couple of months. But quite early, this is at about two or three months after his, uh, after his injury, can you see all this bone that's forming around the hip joint? All of this calcification is quite extensive. Um, and it's a reason why we need to follow these patients up. Um, and he developed contractures, discomfort, but more a huge loss of function in his right hip. He had it similarly affecting his right knee. And we see a lot in patients who have had high energy trauma, trauma into soft tissues. And often if it's associated with a head injury, for some reason, they throw off a lot of extra bone formation. So it needs close follow-up and, and when necessary, early intervention. He's effectively developing a fusion of his hip. Now, it is problematic. And if he develops a solid fusion and it's established, then the hip becomes not really salvageable. And he's a young guy. So um, it was, I think, around the six or eight month mark that I, I went in and excised extensively around his hip joint. Um, this, is a, this, this is the bone that I removed. So a big syringe we've got there as a kind of scale demonstrating how much bone was removed. Um, and this is a, a little uh, video of him that one of my trainees took at the time. Trauma, uh, back in 2012, following with... Let's just... ...heterotopic bone forming around his right hip following his acetabular fracture, which was fixed. Uh, he had this subsequently removed, and he's going to show us now uh, what he can do. So his gait patterns restored pretty well. He still has some issues with his knee. We hadn't done the knee at this point. But what's key is that we managed to get him some range back, quite good range actually in the end. Um, and, and actually we managed to preserve his hip. I mean, this is, we, we followed him up for a couple of years afterwards. And one of the worries is that, that you develop um, a loss of blood supply to the femoral head, which, which within him we, we got away with. Um, so, I guess a couple of take-home messages, and uh, Samir hit you some really good bullet points through his talk. I think what the messages that I'm keen that we relay is that is is that um, with your trauma cases, be it complex or routine, I think I think it's important that you have the right specialist involved in the patient's care, and that has to be a trauma specialist. We've heard it's really important to get the right early diagnosis and at times x-rays just simply are not enough to, to make that diagnosis and so access to more advanced imaging is important. The philosophy of early fixation, anatomic reduction and early mobility is key to a good success, but it doesn't guarantee a good success and we need to follow up these patients and be prepared to intervene at an appropriate time when that is required. It's an MDT approach. We need rehabilitation. We need physio input to get good results. Um, and patients that fail to progress are the ones we need to know about and intervene as early as possible. We can salvage a lot of these situations, but if they're left as they often are, then, then the whole scenario becomes much more complex and the outcomes definitely compromised. Thank you very much.